This video is made possible by NordVPN. Go to nordvpn.com forward slash VPN to get a two year plan plus an additional one month with a huge discount. Improve your internet security now for the price of a cup of coffee. More about this later. As we have told you in a past video, Russia has been trying for years to reduce its dependence on Western economies. It has done so by reducing foreign financing, accumulating huge reserves and promoting a policy of import substitution. However, the result has not been particularly good. The Russian economy is still heavily dependent on foreign supplies, particularly when it comes to high technology. So now, the international sanctions that the Allies have imposed on Russia are beginning to hit the Russian economy hard. Estimates that I'm seeing coming out right now suggest that the Russian economy is going to be trimmed to half of what it was before this invasion, Dalip Singh, US Deputy National Security Advisor. To give you an idea, in 2021, about 80% of Russian manufacturers claimed they could simply not find all the components they needed for their activity in Russia. This is the case of the truck manufacturer, Kamaz, which has acknowledged a 40% drop in production due to a lack of components. According to the company, 15,000 jobs are at risk. What's more, according to a study by Moscow's Higher School of Economics, imports accounted for almost 75% of all sales of non-food consumer goods in 2020. But now, sanctions are closing international markets to Russia. This could be a severe blow to its already battered economy. This is something that Vladimir Putin himself has acknowledged. Our economy will need deep structural changes in these new realities, and I will not hide this. They will not be easy. Vladimir Putin, President of Russia. You can already get an idea of what this all really means if Putin himself speaks of difficulties in a country where, officially, things always go well. And this is where all eyes turn to China. Will the Asian giant rescue the Russian economy? To what extent can Moscow count on Beijing's support? Well, visual politic viewers, in this video, we are going to look at all the details. So, let's get cracking. Ideal in the East. It's no secret, in recent years, Vladimir Putin's Russia and Xi Jinping's China have greatly strengthened their relationship, both politically and in regards to business. The Asian giant is by far Russia's largest trading partner. In fact, almost a quarter of everything Russia buys, from clothing to televisions, comes from the People's Republic of China. And it's not just about trade. Russia has also become one of the leading international recipients of loans from Chinese financial institutions. Between 2000 and 2017, the Russian bear received Chinese financing of more than $150 billion. This cooperation also extends to the military field. As we already covered in the Patreon bulletin, the two countries now frequently carry out joint maneuvers. Perhaps because of all of this, when the two leaders met in Beijing on the 4th of February 2022, on the occasion of the Winter Olympic Games, they declared that the friendship between the two powers had no limits. A friendship with no limitations. In fact, during that meeting, just a few weeks before Russia launched its firestorm over Ukraine, several agreements were signed. For example, China lifted restrictions on Russian wheat imports and the two countries agreed to increase their energy exchanges. In other words, over the next 30 years, China will buy more Russian gas and oil. Precisely because of this growing courtship between Beijing and Moscow, when the Allies began to punish the Russian economy with sanctions, all eyes suddenly turned to China. A country whose government has strongly rejected the use of economic sanctions against Russia. Since 2011, the US has imposed more than 100 sanctions on Russia. However, have the US sanctions solved any problem? Is the world a better place because of those sanctions? Will the Ukraine issue resolve itself thanks to the US sanctions on Russia? Will European security be better guaranteed thanks to the US sanctions on Russia? Chua Chin Ying, a Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson. But the real question is, will China come to Russia's rescue? Could China mitigate the impact of sanctions on the Russian economy? Will Chinese companies consider going after assets and markets that are being abandoned by Western companies. And pay attention here, because there is already speculation that some companies, such as China National Petroleum Corporation, China Petrochemical Corporation, and China Min Metal Corporation, three public giants, are already considering buying many Russians' assets at a bargain price. Can China really save the Russian economy though? Well, the truth is, is that it's not so clear they could, or even that they want to. But before we get to that, if you are buying things online or checking your bank account while using a public Wi-Fi spot, then you really should be using a VPN. And that is where NordVPN comes 
comes in. With NordVPN, you can securely access personal information or work files, encrypt your internet connection, and keep your browsing history and online identity private. But there's more. NordVPN lets you access any of its thousands of servers in various countries all over the globe. So if you want to watch content that's only available in other countries from the streaming platforms to which you subscribe, NordVPN allows you to change your IP and mask your virtual location. It's like magic moving from one country to another without ever leaving your sofa. If you're worried about internet speeds, check this out. AV Test, an independent IT security institute, compared the speeds of top VPNs in the industry. The result? NordVPN is the fastest VPN out there. And wait, because you can use it all on your devices very, very easily. Android, Chrome, Windows, Linux, and under six different devices with one account. So take control of your internet experience today and get an additional month for free by going to nordvpn.com forward slash VPN for around the same price as a cup of coffee a month. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Capacity issue. Now, the first question we have to ask ourselves is, what exactly could China do to support the Russian economy? Well, let's see. We can put several ideas on the table here. For example, the Chinese government could facilitate trade transactions by reducing tariffs and red tape. It could supply Russia with components that they can no longer buy from the West. Or it could also have its large state-owned enterprises invest in companies or projects in Russia. Or it could advance payment of part of the $140 billion that the Russian central bank holds in debt from the Chinese government itself. It could even create a dummy bank to help Russia bypass some of the sanctions. China could do all of these things, but the problem is that none of it would be even close to enough. And you see, on the one hand, Russia has a small and underdeveloped economy that basically exports raw materials. So as much as the Chinese would be willing to buy things in Russia, the truth is that there's not much margin. Besides, this country still sells its raw materials to the West, but even if that were to change by, for example, an oil embargo, in order to sell these materials to China, it would require infrastructure that does not exist today and would take years to build. So yes, it's not as simple as changing the stickers on things. For example, in 2021, China imported 10 billion cubic meters, that's 353 billion cubic feet, of gas from Russia through the new Siberian gas pipeline. Do you know how much it exported to Europe that same year? 175 billion cubic meters, almost 6.2 trillion cubic feet. And that is without mentioning that Beijing will not be willing to depend excessively on Moscow either. On their side, Chinese companies alone also cannot compensate for the loss of access to Western advanced products that Russia is facing because sanctions now prohibit selling them to Russia. And they can't do so for three reasons. Firstly, because even though things are produced in China, it does not mean they can be sold to Russia. Products manufactured by Western companies in China cannot be sold to Russia. Secondly, because technologically, the local Chinese companies are either not so advanced or they depend on supplies from Western companies. Supplies that could themselves be endangered if the finished products then end up in Russia. Take airplanes, for example. International sanctions prohibit Western companies such as Airbus or Boeing from selling aircraft, components, parts, engines, or services of any kind to Russia. Things that are obviously needed to keep planes flying, right? And China either doesn't make these parts or has already said they won't sell them to Russia. And thirdly, because many Chinese companies are afraid of the reputational risk that could end up hurting them in much more lucrative markets, and also that secondary sanctions could end up being approved. That is, sanctions against Russia and any companies that work within Russian territory. This is what has caused companies such as Volvo or TikTok, which are Chinese owned, to suspend some operations in Russia that were not affected by the sanctions. And exactly the same reasons explain why two of China's big four state-owned banks, the Bank of China and the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, limited their operations with Russia as soon as the invasion began. Which is also the same thing that the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, basically the Chinese World Bank, has done by suspending lending to Russia and Belarus. China is trying to keep Russia at a distance. They don't want to expose themselves by circumventing international sanctions. Simon Harvey, head of currency analysis at Monex Europe. Along the same lines, regarding investment in Russia, yes, it is possible that some Chinese SOEs may end up buying assets in Russia at bargain prices. But also, it doesn't seem very likely. The fear of sanctions, reputational risk, and the fact that the Russian market is very small are things holding back any massive landing. 
For example, consider Xiaomi, which has almost 40% of the Russian smartphone market. Yes, it would surely benefit from the exit of companies like Apple, but it will hardly take the risk of making large investments in a country that barely accounts for 3% of its global sales. China will not save the sinking ship of the Russian economy. Perhaps it will allow it to float a little longer and sink a little slower. Ezwar Prasad, economist at Cornell University. That is to say that even if Xi Jinping's government really wanted to lend Russia a hand, it may not have the capacity to do so on a large scale because obviously the Chinese don't want to lose out along the way. But the truth is that it's not even really clear if they want to save Russia. Check this out. No more problems, please. The Chinese economy is not exactly running at its peak. In 2022, it expects to grow by 5.5%, its lowest target since 1991. And it is not actually certain at all that they will achieve it. China is currently dealing with, brace yourselves, a real estate crisis, a potential financial crisis, the aftermath of state intervention in the technology sector, competition from new production markets such as Vietnam, a Congress that has to re-elect Xi Jinping, a demographic crisis, and to top it all off, the dreaded coronavirus. Because yes, in China, they are still locking people in their homes. Pressure mounts in Shanghai, a city of 25 million, as COVID-19 closures remain in effect. Crazy, right? In other words, China is not exactly celebrating all of its successes right now. Xi Jinping's government already has enough headaches without risking sanctions and problems of all kinds for supporting an economy as small as the Russian one. Take a look at this graph, for example. While capital is flowing into most emerging economies, it is flowing out of China, which may exacerbate the crisis there. It is possible that the Russian invasion of Ukraine has changed the perception of many investors and they no longer trust China as much as they once did. A capital outflow that could be aggravated by the US Federal Reserve's rate hike. Why? Because when a country like the United States raises rates, investors prefer to invest in US debt, for example, rather than the debt of riskier countries as the yield gap with emerging economies narrows. This could jeopardize a large part of these investments. Foreign holdings of Chinese bonds top 500 billion dollars in December 2021, up nearly 50% in 2020. And that's not all. To top it all off, the war in Ukraine has contributed to increasing the price of energy, raw materials, and food. Yet another old chestnut for China. It's an economy, visual politic fans, that now needs foreign investment and international markets more than ever for its exports. And do you know what? The United States and the European Union are far, far more important to China than the Russian economy is. Don't believe me? Take a look at some of these numbers. In 2021, trade between China and Russia was about $147 billion. A lot, right? But with the United States, the figure exceeded $825 billion, and with the European Union, $750 billion. In other words, trade with the United States and the European Union was almost 11 times greater than trade with Russia in 2021. And this is without mentioning allied countries such as Japan, South Korea, and Australia, that would almost certainly comply with any international sanction. This is true for trade. As far as investment flows are concerned, it is even more exaggerated. So to sum it up, China has problems. China needs the markets and international investors and Russia in the global economy matters rather little. And we're not done yet. A fire or an opportunity. For China, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is gradually turning into a huge nightmare. Energy costs have skyrocketed, investor fear has grown, the war is slowing down all rail routes connecting China to Europe via Russia, and to top it all off, China's neighbours are now announcing record increases in their military budgets, which clearly does not amuse Beijing. Shinzo Abe, the former Prime Minister of Japan, has even been in favour of reaching an agreement for the United States to deploy nuclear weapons in the land of the rising sun. So we could say that, with each passing day, the invasion of Ukraine is less and less funny in China. Wait a minute though, because one good thing may have come out of it for Beijing. Check this out. Xi Jinping urged Joe Biden to work together for peace. War benefits no one. Yes, China can now use its neutrality to negotiate with the United States in exchange for certain benefits. For example, eliminating part of the tariffs approved by Trump. In fact, shortly after the invasion on the 18th of March 2022, Xi Jinping and Joe Biden held a telephone summit that approved the tone of the talks. And as a gesture of goodwill, the Biden administration has eliminated tariffs on 352 Chinese products and US-listed Chinese companies soared in the stock market on the hope that relations between the two countries would normalize. So yes, it is possible that Chinese companies will buy assets at bargain prices in Russia, and even Xi Jinping's government may make a gesture to the gallery, but it is unlikely that things will go much further. Most likely, China will not even attempt to rescue 
rescue the Russian economy. Bad luck for Moscow. So how is Russia preparing to face the sanctions? How does Vladimir Putin's government expect to withstand the punishment that the allied countries are imposing on Russia? Well, Visual Politics fans, we'll look at that in an upcoming video here on Visual Politics. So don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And of course, if you found this video interesting, then why wouldn't you? Give us a hand by liking it and leaving your impressions in the comments below. We read them all. All the best. I'll see you next time.